This is Mike Babcock. At one point in time, he was seen as one of the best coaches a hockey team could employ. He was a Stanley Cup champion, a potential Hall of Famer, the wins leader for a storied franchise like the Detroit Red Wings, and a gold medal winner. But a dressing room with Babcock at the helm hid some of the darkest secrets a dressing room could hide. With multiple reports of abuse coming to light in 2019, after his firing from the Toronto Maple Leafs, Babcock targeted two groups of players in his career, rookies and veterans in the twilight of their careers. It was those groups that he had the most power over, since it was either deal with him or just don't get playing time. So when the Blue Jackets decided to make Babcock their head coach this summer, a lot of people were shocked, and not too many were surprised when he did it again. In this video, we will go through the history of Babcock's failures as a head coach, as well as his most recent downfall in Columbus. And hey, if you're using Apple AirPlay to watch this on a TV in your office, be sure to like and subscribe. Mike Babcock got his start as an NHL head coach in 2003 with the Mighty Ducks of Anaheim. And it was in this first season where Babcock's cycle of abuse began with defenseman Mike Commodore. No relation to this bad boy. Commodore was traded from the Devils to the Ducks, and was initially seen as a key piece in the trade, and he'd show up to camp expecting to make the team, just for Babcock to tell the media that Commodore showed up out of shape and made the decision to send Commodore down. Now Commodore swears he was not out of shape, simply because he couldn't afford to do that with so much on the line. When Commodore was called up midway through the season, the first thing Babcock and the training staff did was a skinfold test. Babcock would then announce the results to Commodore in front of the whole entire team. Commodore would never fully shake this reputation, and it would follow him throughout his whole career. And towards the end of Commodore's career, he'd go into free agency expecting a late summer contract from a team that needed veteran presence. Commodore would get a call from his agent just five minutes into free agency, saying that there was a contract from the Red Wings where Babcock was now the head coach, and that he only had 15 minutes to decide. Commodore had a gut feeling and told his agent that Babcock just wanted to end his career. He would call Red Wings GM Ken Holland and ask if Babcock really wanted him, and Holland would say yes. So Commodore then called Babcock, and Babcock would say that he needed a right-handed shot to play alongside Nicholas Lidstrom. But even after hearing this, Commodore would still be skeptical. He would tell his agent about Babcock's plans, and his agent was like, Commodore, are you stupid? You need to take this. Commodore accepted the deal, and when he got to Detroit, he realized he should have trusted his gut. Commodore would be routinely scratched by Babcock, going back on the promise that he made to him, playing only 17 games before being traded at the deadline. Next up on Babcock's kill list would be Mike Madonna. Madonna at one point in his career was one of the very best players in the NHL. He won a cup with the Dallas Stars, became a member of the Hockey Hall of Fame, and is the all-time leading goal scorer in the NHL for US-born players. But out of all of his accomplishments, he never achieved one huge milestone, and it was because of Mike Babcock. When Madonna was 40 years old, he signed with the Red Wings, his hometown team, looking to capture one final cup before his retirement. And once again, Babcock would take advantage of a player who was on their last leg in the NHL. Madonna would get injured early in the year and missed most of the season. But when Madonna came back, he still had the opportunity to hit 1,500 games played, an honor that only 21 former NHLers hold. Yet with a playoff spot locked up, Babcock still decided to healthy scratch Madonna in one of the final regular season games. Madonna would end his career with 1,499 games played, one short of the milestone. Many years later, Detroit enforcer Darren McCarty would be asked about how he felt about Babcock. Uh, Babcock benching Madonna in what would have been his 1500th game. He retired with 1499. I saw that look on your face right there. We'll move on. What's that tell you? Doesn't it reveal itself of what we've found out about said Babcock or whatever? While Babcock was still in Detroit, he had another incident with longtime Detroit Red Wing Johan Franzen. From the mid-2000s to the early 2010s, the Mule was an exceptional player for the Red Wings. But by 2015, age and injuries had caught up to Franzen. With the sun setting on his career, Babcock decided to turn his anger towards Franzen. 
During Game 5 of a Stanley Cup playoff series with the Nashville Predators, Mike Babcock would verbally assault Franzen. It would be Chris Chelios who brought the story to light in 2019, saying it was one of the worst things he had ever seen. Franzen had a nervous breakdown from the assault. He was also suffering from post-concussion syndrome and depression at the time, too, leading to him retiring shortly after that season. There's an interview with Franzen incredibly shaken up over the incident, even after many years have passed. In this interview, Franzen would say, He's a terrible person. The worst I ever met. He's a bully who was attacking people. And finally, after Babcock's tenure in Detroit came to an end, he would sign a massive eight-year deal to coach the Toronto Maple Leafs, a contract that would have just ended this past season. And during his tenure at the helm of the Maple Leafs, he targeted a future superstar in Mitch Marner. Part of Babcock's plan for Marner was forcing the young phenom to rank his teammates on a list based on how hard they worked on the ice. Marner was confused, but felt he had to play along with the assignment so it didn't cost him any future playing time. Marner would put himself at the bottom of the list, since he didn't want to single anyone out. And to Marner's surprise, Babcock would share the list with his teammates, embarrassing Marner in front of his teammates. Marner would later say that he was lucky that the guys in the locker room stood by him, and understood he was pressured into making that list. When the Leafs found out, it would be one of the main reasons Babcock would lose his job in Toronto. So with all these stories of Babcock's abuse in the past, it came as a shock when Babcock would sign a contract with the Blue Jackets this past summer. The stories were well documented, and in Marner's case, Babcock even confirmed it. So how the heck did he come back? The Blue Jackets knew it would be a risky hire, but they said they did their due diligence and contacted people to learn more about Babcock's character. The person they would end up contacting was Ken Hitchcock, a former coach for the Blue Jackets as well as a friend and colleague of Babcock from his stints with the Canadian national team. Seems like a bad person to contact if you want an unbiased opinion. So Babcock was back in the NHL and tasked with coaching a Blue Jackets team that is full of young prospects. Yes, you heard that correct. They hired the guy who is notorious for taking advantage of young prospects to coach a team full of young prospects and would mess up almost immediately. During a segment on the podcast Spitting Chicklets, Paul Bissonnette would say that a player contacted him about strange interviews players were having with Babcock. Allegedly, Babcock would call players in for one-on-one -on -one meetings in his office and ask the player to use Apple AirPlay to broadcast their phones on the TV in his office as some sort of way to understand what type of person they were and to share photos of their family and personal lives. After this story broke, Babcock would say it was a harmless exercise, and that players had control over what they shared with him, and that it was just a way to get to know his players better. Further saying that his meeting with Boone Jenner, the captain of the Blue Jackets, went perfectly fine, with the two of them talking about their family and sharing photos of his home, farm, and his soon-to-be wife. Jenner would confirm this story probably at the behest of Blue Jackets upper management and to hopefully end this saga and return to doing his job, you know, playing hockey. Yet Bissonette wouldn't back down, portraying the meetings as a lot more sinister than the Blue Jackets organization made it seem. It seemed that the league and the NHLPA were initially satisfied with the statements and weren't going to go any deeper. But as Bissonette and other members of the media continued to mount pressure, ultimately the NHLPA would conduct an investigation. And when the NHLPA dug in deeper, it became apparent that there was an interview with a Blue Jackets player that was unlike the interviews he conducted with Goudreau and Jenner. This meeting allegedly wasn't in Babcock's office or at a Columbus facility. This alleged meeting would happen between Babcock and a young Blue Jackets player with Babcock having control of the player's phone for a few minutes, going against his statement that the players were in full control of what they shared. Once again showing Babcock's cycle of singling out players, especially young ones, and putting them in compromising positions in order to control them. 
On September 17th, 2023, Mike Babcock would resign from his head coach role, likely putting an end to Babcock's tenure as an NHL head coach. Many will now ask questions of the Blue Jackets organization, but the one shining positive is that the players now have an avenue to talk about these problems. Problems that if they brought within the organization, they might get punished for. Especially since Elliot Friedman, a reporter for Sportsnet, believes that whoever reached out to Biz might not have been on the Blue Jackets, showing that there is some solidarity with players around the league to stamp out some of these problems. There's still plenty of work that needs to be done, and we're still only a bit removed from the Kyle Beach incident in 2010, but the players can now celebrate the end of Mike Babcock, just as Mike Commodore did, posting a hashtag pack your tweet and buying a bottle of Dom Perignon to toast to the occasion. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and give your thoughts on this whole situation. Hope to see you back on this channel again.